An artist makes things and they don't always know why they do it, you know. I did a lot of pottery in college. The first pottery, an intro to pottery was kind of boring. That's all they did is make a tile, cut it out of a regular tile and design the tile and try and get that fired. And then we did a vase using a coil method with a template. So we just kind of built it up so the template would be the same as what you're trying to do with the coils. So it was rather boring and later on I transferred to St. Cloud State College and they had a large uh, ceramic department there, a lot of potter's wheels and I was really fascinated with you know, making pottery on the wheel. They had a really excellent teacher and I think he's the one that probably turned the tide for me and I, I was fascinated by how you could form that clay from a lump into a nice vase or cup or something. And I just continued on that with a kick wheel. It wasn't electric, it was a Bernard Leach potter's wheel. And that's what he used too. And just uh, the tactile sensation of, you know, making something 3D and something that would be permanent. You know, like you dig up things from ancient uh, civilizations and the pottery looks like as fresh as the day it was made usually especially if it's high fired and that's what I got fascinated in with stoneware that's high fired and I was just uh, fascinated with the idea that it would last forever and I like that. My pottery uh, kind of reflects just my inner self even though I'm a Native American I am not considered a Native American artist because a Native American artist shows the designs from his tribe and it's not necessarily a fine art and to me fine art is how a person perceives the world and how the designs come from that a person's perception whether he's German or Native American or Scandinavian or African it doesn't matter to an artist because a fine artist is reflecting his perception of the world and a pot like this this vase here doesn't have a definable design as Native American so a pot like this is first of all a shape that I wanted to do I hadn't been making pottery for a long time so I just started basic cylinder shapes and I did a lot of work on rims when I was uh, going to the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh and I kind of put those two together something to keep me in a creative mood and then I love to uh, do glazing and I put a lot of uh, little things on here I put some stains right on the bare clay the raw clay as I made the pot and I put some on after I was glazing the pot so after it was all bisque fired and everything and I wanted to get those contrasts and I love doing that because you don't know what the result will be if you look at it it has kind of a little Japanese influence because they love to look at the mountains and Mount Fuji and landscapes and things and uh, shrubberies and all that and all of that is in this pottery and I can see it myself and I just kind of want it to be kind of mysterious and, that, and it turned out this is my favorite pot and I think it's probably my best glazing job I've ever done so I'll show you just uh, what I mean kind of like uh, misty looking uh, hills and things and kind of where there's brush and all that but it's not made that way it's just kind of something that you can imagine or meditate on my approach is to 
keep a wide open mind. And whatever comes to me, I kind of adopt and work it and explore it and try to find something that attracted me to that idea. The pottery that I have in my hand now is made from a found object. It's a real uh, elaborate design and it's made out of porcelain, high-fired porcelain with a clear glaze. I took an impression of a fly swatter, an old plastic fly swatter, the, you know, the very unattractive fly swatter, you know, as opposed to the wire ones which are kind of nicer. I took an impression of it and made two sides. So I could make a hundred of these. I have the, uh, the cast of the fly swatter in plaster of Paris and I could just press clay in that thing all day and make uh, all kinds of uh, vases like this. And I hand built the rest of it and the top was made on a wheel and I kind of pieced it all together. And I have one, it's so perfect and blah that I put one design on here, it's a design, it's just a flaw it looks like, and it kind of relates back to the beading that the people do in our tribe, and they try to put one bead out of place, just to show that we're not perfect, and only the Creator and the Great Spirit is perfect, and that's why we kind of acknowledge that we are just human beings, and we're full of flaws. Here's another piece, one of those whimsical kind of things. To me it's a creative piece and the idea is kind of goofy. I just made a cylinder again. I was working on some pottery with my friend John Langer who up in northern Wisconsin. He actually was a student of mine. He was a teacher who took my adult class in the evening and he loved it so much he has his own pottery studio and kills right now. So we were just goofing around and I said I'm going to take the cylinder and I'm going to put a ping pong ball inside. I tied some wire on the ping pong ball. I put the wire through the side of a freshly made cylinder. And I knew that if I pulled it slow, it would pull the pottery apart and it would fall, collapse. The top would even go down. So I pulled it really fast. I wanted to have this explosion kind of thing coming out of the pottery. And it's, it's perfectly round from the ping pong ball. And to do it on the other side, I did the same thing. Wrapped the ping pong ball with wire and put the wire through and then I just pulled the ball right through it. So it looks like it exploded both ways from inside. Not coming in one side and going out the other. It's coming from inside on both of them. That's the way it went naturally. This uh, kind of uh, oval shape to it. And I just like doing things like that because the clay can do it, you know. You can't do it with steel or anything unless you use more powerful things like guns or something or real explosives. And on the bottom I just have my stamp which is a JL made out of a, a little stamp of clay and I fired the clay so I can just press it on most of my pottery. It's uh, kind of a, a little chop thing that the Japanese use too just to kind of show their identity on their pottery. One of my more traditional things when I was beginning, we were influenced a lot by Japanese pottery. They'd been doing it for thousands of years and they're still doing it. Real simple things and utilitarian. They did a lot of teapots, teacups, bowls, and platters. Things to use in their everyday living. This teapot is made with that influence, I'm not real good at brush work, but I enjoy looking at just a simple Japanese design and it might mean something different than what I thought. It's just a nice design to me. The lid is a rose lid, they call it, because it's uh, kind of made like a little bowl and it just kind of fits over another shape on the teapot rather than a traditional uh, cover on a teapot. The glaze is a celadon glaze on stonework clay with a bamboo handle, which is kind of a traditional thing in Japan, is to have a lot of bamboo. And on the bottom I signed it, it says J.D. Loud 1971. And 
there are cups that go with this, six cups. And there's a tea storage container with a bamboo handle and a creamer and a sugar bowl. So it's a, like a 10 piece set. We're gonna have um, a few more tea ceremonies. We just invite people over and we have tea. When we fill this up, it'll fill all six teacups. I enjoyed making this kind of a set too. This wall hanging that I have here now is in the shape of a shield and it's not representative of my tribe because this is Geronimo or Hieronimo, however you want to pronounce it. And the connection here is, it reminds me of my grandfather because he saw Geronimo and told me a little bit about that meeting, not a meeting, but just a visual of seeing this man in person. My grandfather went to Carlisle Indian School as a boarding school when he was 12 years old on up. You know, he stayed there for a few years. But while, while he was there, that was the time when Geronimo was causing a lot of problems for the army because he wouldn't surrender and then and moved to a reservation. So he became famous for being a general of his tribe and no one could catch him because he was in the mountains in the southwest. And this figure of Geronimo came from a little pocketbook, just an inexpensive pocketbook with a black and white photo. And I zeroed in on it with my magnifying glass the kind you look at uh, slides with, if they're a viewer for photographs, and I could see all the little dots in it. So I, I copied that and I cut it out of a silk screen myself. I used some cobalt uh, oxide mixed with water, and I silk screened that onto a flat piece of clay, porcelain clay, and I put some uh, letters in to show that it was Geronimo, and I just liked that face. The connection with my grandfather is that when Geronimo was, he, they say he was captured, but he actually just gave himself up. Um, they put him in chains and they paraded him down the streets in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And they had a sign on, the, on him or else on the wagon that he was, it was being carted in or whatever. And there was a sign around at the time and it said, here is the savage, here is the wild savage. And he was in chains and being led down the street. And they wanted all these young little Indian boys to see this. Yeah. I don't know if it was a deterrent or what, so that they wouldn't, you know, try to do what Geronimo did, you know, and rebel and cause trouble for the army or the white society. And that's what he remembers of seeing Geronimo in chains going down the street. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So I had this connection with Geronimo because of who he was and what he stood for. And I kind of respect uh, the way he lived. And I have these eagle feathers um, hanging from this because eagle feathers are real prized by our, our tribe and many tribes because of what they re represent. Well, they represent the mighty eagle, and the eagle is um, is something that uh, just kind of undaunted by by uh, the environment, and he's powerful, and he just kind of uh, is majestic, and the feathers are sacred to you know. Native Americans, they make headdresses out of them, they give them as rewards for doing something of brave, a bravery uh, act. And um, the heartbeat of the eagle, they say, is what they go by for the drum sound, you know, the beat of the drum. They kind of say it's the eagle's heartbeat, and that's what they uh, have invested in the eagle. An artist makes things and they don't always know why they do it, you know. It's just, I thought it, it, it was a good contrast to the circle here to go, you know, into the circle also, you know. And the moon and the sun 
and the earth right here, how they rotate. And they're a part of the earth, you know, part of our lives. I do a lot of whimsical kind of things that I can, you know, my mind will conjure up. I can never predict what it's going to be. But when I think of it or if I see something, I'll say, hey, that would make an interesting object of some kind. Who would make a canteen out of ceramic and carry that around with them in the desert or something? I made this out of porcelain and I got the idea from the water main kind of things that are on every street and you can see them and I'd like that and we had one and somebody brought it to the art room and you know, like a found object so I took a cast of that and it says water and I just added where it's from, Seymour, Wisconsin. It just says Seymour, and then I put number two because I made another one. I put the year, 1974, and it holds about a gallon of water, and it's on both sides. The strap I actually got from a, a purse that I made when I was in the eighth grade, in high school, of course, and it was probably the year I got sick also if it was eighth grade, because I loved doing uh, leather work, and we did leather work in shop, industrial arts shop, and I did all the snaps and everything like that, and it went for a purse that had all the tooling and everything on it, and I made that for my mother, and she got tired of the purse, I guess, and I found it, and I said, I think I'll use that strap. But I actually found the purse when I went up to my house uh, this year, I found the purse in an old uh, storage container, so I still got the purse too. It's kind of unusual you know, to have a, a canteen made out of porcelain, but I did other ones too. So. I have another canteen here, and this canteen was based on something organic, you know, something that grows like mushrooms on a, or toadstools around a tree or something and the way they haphazardly are arranged and I kind of put that on this so it's kind of a perfect shape with all kinds of organic stuff on it kind of like it caught something but I made it out of two flat bowls or shallow bowls and joined them on the edge here you can't really see it the top I wanted to you know instead of straight up I just wanted an angle so when you're drinking it's easier to drink out of, you know, instead of tipping it all the way over. And this holds about a gallon and a half or so. I made the handles so it could be hung from something. Again, it's not a practical thing, you know, that you take on your horse or something or carry on a trip. And this knot comes out so that you can put it around your shoulder. Theoretically, it's a canteen. But in practicality, it's not a canteen because it's very impractical. It's too heavy for one thing. Description of when I was at a show. It just says organic canteen stoneware reduction. Price $250. Must be hung on wall. The rope is special. I wanted it to be something unusual, you know, like the pot itself. And I didn't want to just grab an old rope out of the hardware store or something. So I, I like to scavenge. I try to look for something a little unusual. And I found this amongst some old uh, pallets, like on, around a warehouse. And this rope was around, tied on something. And I said, that yeah, looks very unusual. And it's got, you know, dark and light and what, four colors in that rope. And I never saw a rope made like that before. Who would do that, you know? some. Uh, country where you know that's maybe that's all they had or that's all they really cared to put in it so I thought it was kind of unusual and I don't know where the ropes from actually so I just kind of hang it on the wall though that's why I shortened it like that
Thank you.